Good morning, everyone. Just going? There you go. So good morning, everyone. Um, still morning. Got about four minutes according to my watch. Um, my name is Warner Allen, and um, I'm an attorney with the Warren Allen Law Firm, uh, and a very poor substitute um, for Lynn Snodgrass, who um, is attending her husband, um, who is just finished uh, some surgery apparently, so, um, and we heard that the results of that are, were excellent, so that's all good stuff. Um, thank you um, all for coming today. Um, I want to thank our presenting sponsors, uh, Portland General Electric, and uh, our presenting sponsor, Columbia Bank. Um, also, our stakeholder sponsor, Gresham Barlow School District. And last but not least, Metro East Community Media. Thank you, Keith. Um, replay schedules, by the way, um, are available on the registration table um, as you came in and as you go out. So you'll have an opportunity to, to replay this if, uh, if you pick up that schedule and if you have access to um, that cable. Um, I'd like to recognize the elected official we have here today. Um, Councillor Carolyn Eccles is right there. Thank you very much. Also recognize um, board members. I guess I met. <laughs> <laughs> and Carolyn Eccles. Thank you. She gets double duty. So. Andrew Mason um, was selected as the first full-time executive director for the Willamette Falls Trust, a nonprofit organization created in 2015 to raise resources and advocate for the revitalization of the former, former Blue Heron paper mill site in Oregon City and the Riverwalk experience. The Riverwalk, one piece of a larger Willamette um, Falls Trust project, will connect downtown Oregon City to Willamette Falls. It will create a world-class public space with views of the Willamette Falls that have frankly been hidden from the public for over a century. Mr. Mason, who assumed his new role in 2018, has a strong background in fundraising, strategic planning, program development, and executive leadership. He has knowledge and experience in government relations and collaborative management. He also has successfully secured federal, state, and local public and private sector funding, which are critical in this complicated project. He most recently served as the executive director for Open School, which was at the former Drake 70s Garden Center site. When hired, Andrew said, quote, I come to this project with a strong sense of its value to our community, state, and nation. Its success will take committed and unwavering investment from the entire region and an ability to lever leverage and extend our community connections and resources. Can you say Gresham or the Grand Ronde tribe? So let's get the entire scoop on this project and see how Gresham can be a part of the big splash at Willamette Falls. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see how, how Gresham can be the part of the big splash. Okay, so I'm trying to, I gotta turn something on up here for me too. Thanks for coming to hear about Willamette Falls. So here's the, 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 the lead question is, and it is a trick question, how many of you have been to Willamette Falls? Okay, so now, now, you gotta own it. I mean, how many of you have been to Willamette Falls? Like, what does that mean that you've been there? When you've been there, you've seen it from the overlook? Is that what you mean? Like, where, say more. Betsy gives us tours all the time. Ah, you got tours from Betsy. All right, all right, she's got it in. Anybody else like been to the brink? Okay, so you know I'm just gonna so the the um, 
so the point here is that numbers of you raised your hands and said, okay, I've been there, but then when it really comes down to like standing on the edge, this is the kooky thing. Like this is crazy, ladies and gentlemen. We've got the North American continent's second largest waterfall within 14 miles of where we are right now. And there's not a wax museum there. Like, what's going on? And so, um, I, I'm 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 being a goofball with that one. But really, there's um, there's a lot of reasons why uh, uh, all of us should be able to get a lot closer than an overlook that is uh, half mile away, whether you're on the 205 side or the Oregon City side, or. Um, or whether or not access should be limited to whether or not you've got a relationship with the landowner or whether or not uh, you're with me because I happen to have one of the keys that opens the four chain link fences that stand between you and the North American continent's second largest waterfall by volume. It isn't right. So that's, that's kind of what I'm here to, here to talk a little bit about today. So, um, okay. Uh, this, just FYI, uh, the mark back there is, so we're doing virtual reality tours of the site, which are kind of interesting just in and of themselves doing a virtual reality tour. What you could do is if you go to that link, you can then do a tour of the site with your phone. It's another version of a virtual reality tour. If you haven't been to this site or been in this site, it really is um, a picture and the experience is, is, um, is, is worth a thousand words. So that's what I'm uh, uh, giving you an opportunity to potentially uh, do that while we talk. If you want to do that, I'm not worried about the distraction. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how all that rolls. Uh, we've, we've, we've done some of this with, with really, really large groups um, of more than 100. So uh, here's what I'm trying to give you a feel for today. Oregon City has the second largest waterfall in the country in terms of volume of water. I'm really embarrassed that I didn't know that, but I bet a lot of people don't know that. When I grew up in Oregon City, I may have witnessed them once from a distance. The only other time I think I actually saw the falls was when I was a paper mill employee. Somebody took me on a tour all the way through to the end of the paper mill so I could glimpse the falls. That was my exposure after living there all my life. It's unbelievable to me that more residents of Oregon City can't see them, can't experience them. The Willamette Falls River Walk is a once-in-a-lifetime project. This is going to be a gathering place. It will be a very local place. So I would surely hope that the citizens of the Oregon City area are as excited as I am about the project and make their personal commitments, uh, whatever they can, so that we can get this going. These projects, they don't come along very often. And Oregon City is incredibly fortunate to have the opportunity to do this. They're fortunate to have this natural treasure in their backyard. We have public money come in to support it. They're very lucky that there are a group of individuals who have the vision to make this happen. This is a pretty unique project, so I hope people appreciate that this should happen and that they need to throw their support behind it. Go, do it. <laughs> build it. Let's build this thing. OK. So that's, uh, there's a word from, from Connie Balmer, who was an Oregon city, there you go, and that's where we get the roar of the falls. It'll keep scrolling back if I let it do that. Um, the, 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 she was an Oregon city high school graduate and worked her way through college, working the night shift at the Crown Zellerbach Mill on the West Lynn side uh, uh, before um, uh, then, then meeting a gentleman who is now worth billions of dollars as the CEO of, of the former CEO of Microsoft Corporation. And as a result, she decided to share some of that, uh, that treasure to help bring this project to life and so has, has, has helped to spur what it is that we're doing. So what are we doing? Um, uh, and I, you know, th th there's 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 different views of the site that the video helped to see that the that the that the that the virtual reality tour is going to see. But essentially, we're talking about right now. Um, <clears throat> Willamette Falls, just south of Oregon City, has 50 
acres of land that is, was formerly put to industrial use is held in private hands and uh, is not functioning as an industrial use right now, is adding, uh, frankly, no value whatsoever to the economy, certainly in the way that it has for a century plus, because both of those mills have shut down in the last eight years. So we really are having a transition moment in our economy. And the second of those two mills shut down uh, not even two calendar years ago, and there's noises about that potentially getting up and going again uh, for a very limited time, I imagine, and even the, the, the story in the, the Portland Business Journal um, talk about that as being for a limited time. But what do we do with this? 50 acres of land surrounding the North American continent's second largest waterfall. We have an opportunity to re-envision uh, what's happening now that we haven't had for well over a century. And so part of the job uh, that, that the Willamette Falls Trust, and I'll talk a little bit about what our nonprofit's role is in this project, is doing, is trying to call attention to that very fact. And what's interesting is because you know you're all it's all surrounded by this stuff. Um, there are the number of people who uh, haven't been there is significant, uh, who don't uh, who don't know that it's the second largest waterfall on the continent is large. I mean, really, and I have to kind of work back from people. And be, it's okay, you don't have to be embarrassed by that one. I'm not doing that to embarrass people. It's the 17th widest waterfall on planet Earth. But there are at least, um, I would say, a solid 50% of the people that I meet outside of Oregon City and West Lynn mistake Willamette Falls for Multnomah Falls. So in terms of calling the attention, oh yeah, it's just like, well, that's a great place. I like going out to the lodge and the trip out the gorge is great when we go there. <laughs> It may be a function of people coming into the Portland metro area, but so to call attention to what's happening here and to raise the attention, and then you look and you see you know, all these buildings and you think, I don't wanna, well, I, you know, this thing is huge, I don't wanna touch that. And we have an opportunity that we have not had for a century plus to be able to address what we might do with the access other than having um, some now quiet derelict industrial buildings. So now we, now we take you on a history lesson. Um, a, a little bit about, I mean, it's, it, you know, the, the um, it, it is, so Willamette Falls uh, is a, a, a sacred place to multiple uh, Native American tribes, current confederations of tribes as they're configured now and registered federally. But um, it's, it's also a, 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 a place of reverence for those who we've taken on tours and who go out there and see it and really can experience the power and spray of what's going on there. It, it was largely the destination of the Oregon Trail, and so in terms of the history beyond the Native American history, you've got the end of the Oregon Trail Museum there, but this is where people came, right? They, uh, back in, after Lewis and Clark paddled out up the M Missouri River, then they built the St. Louis Arch and everybody started walking through the arch and they wanted to go from there to Willamette Falls. That's a little bit of a joke, right? You gotta roll with me on this one. But, but really, so people walked, you know, they took their time to get out to the Willamette Valley to experience the, the, the riches of the soil, the fertile Willamette Valley, but they also were really coming to the riches of the falls where there were, you, you had fish that were congregating there, you had the power of the falls that were congregating there. Um, it's, 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 it really is an indescribable experience. And as a result, um, this was also a place of, of the cradle of Western innovation, um, not to mention the, you know, we, we were the first, Oregon City was the first city incorporated west of the Mississippi, um, and, uh, and the largest city west of the Mississippi until 1848. For those of you who, this is one thing Clackamas County has on Multnomah County, is they still hold the, the plat map to the city of San Francisco, because when it wanted to apply and become a city, they had to come to the territorial capital. And so it rests right now in the, in, in the Clackamas County archives. Um, so there's a significant amount of both Native American and pioneer history that's occurring uh, on the site, there's there's innovation from the standpoint of of, of, of industry that happened there. Uh, so lots of stuff. Um, uh, so so what happened then? Now I'm gonna uh, maybe I want to go forward one. No, I want to go forward. Uh, I guess I missed my 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 back eight. So the. Um, uh, a little bit of, of, of the more recent history. 
The focus of the Willamette Falls Trust right now is on the Oregon City side, is on the east side of the river. Uh, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll get maps and diagrams in a minute, but here's, here's what happened is we had two places that were, as, as or, here was Oregon producing um, uh, uh, timber, uh, producing value, wealth, jobs for families across the, the, across the state and the region. Um, and you had the ancillary uh, value add industries like paper making, then two of which were there to harness the power of falls and help turn the paper, t turn the logs into pulp and help produce paper um, until 2011, at which point the east side of the river, uh, the Blue Heron Mill, went, went, went bankrupt. It was formerly the um, Publishers Paper, Smurfit Paper, and the Hawley Paper Company. So a series of four paper companies that basically spanned from the, the almost the, right at the beginning of the 20th century until w uh, well into the 21st century. And then they shut down, and now you had a lot of people looking for work. Um, and, and at that point, then, we had to figure out, what, to, what do you do with that site? Well, we have an opportunity. And so Oregon City said, we have an opportunity, but this is an opportunity that is um, uh, uh, bigger than us, if you will. You know, we've got, a, we've got a fairly small town, Oregon. We've got a big site. It's the potential. If this thing had been west of the Mississippi, it would already be a national park by now. Um, that's a quote from the, from the former Metro president, by the way. Um, but, but really, so, so what do you do now with this, with this site? And uh, there's a lot of reasons to be afraid of it. There are a lot of large structures there, which again, you've been able to, I hope, to have the, you know, see in the pictures and that kind of thing. So from a demolition and potentially an environmental contamination standpoint, there are good reasons to be concerned. Three years of thinking about what do you do with this site from 2011 to 2014, a private buyer came in and bought the property. Falls Legacy LLC, run by George Heidegger, Be Heidegger and Betsy is his daughter, where we how, how we got access out there. So now a private uh, entity owns that and currently does own that. Um, at that point then, the, um, the, the public entities, uh, Oregon City, who then said, uh -oh, okay, let's come together with the state, the county, and the metro regional government, and let's figure out what we can do since, you know, buying it is not in the cards right now. And so they secured and negotiated with Falls Legacy LLC an easement, an easement that goes with the property in perpetuity. So let me talk a little bit about the property. And I'm getting out of order of my, for myself. So we secured an easement. Here's the thing to take away now. And again, I'll get to the pictures here of what, what we're talking about in a minute. But it, essentially, we had the opportunity to secure access to the nation's largest waterfall across this 22 and a half acre site um, in perpetuity. So it doesn't matter who owns it. You can, you can get out there. And so then um, we got together with thousands of Oregonians um, in, in, in downtown Oregon City in downtown Portland, throughout the, at OMSI, throughout the region. We talked with specific groups, um, recreational groups, uh, cultural and historical groups, uh, angler groups, you know, fisher folk, uh, natural resource types people, to say, what should we do? And came up with four uh, core values that really helped to drive what it was that we were doing. Um, that part you already know, because I said, uh, I'm gonna, and so I'm gonna, I, I, I'm losing myself on my history. So here's our group of people that came together, right, to say, okay, now we've gotta come up with an easement and figure out what it is that we're gonna, what we're gonna do and how we're gonna hear from Oregonians. And that really is our, your, your core people that are associated here. You got, you know, there's a logo there for Oregon City because we're located in Oregon City. Clackamas County, because it's in Clackamas County. Um, but Oregon tourism is a part of what's going on here. Um, uh, and, and then, sorry, the this, this, this state and metro regional governments. And there are five sovereign tribes, five sovereign nations. Part of what we're engaged in here is diplomacy. But what we also asked as we started talking to the state and said, what should we do here? We said, what sh which tribes are interested? The Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde are one who will say, and you're very clear, that this is their historical fishing grounds of the Confederation. It is a complicated, a very complicated history. There are three tribes on the, fishing on the Columbia River who received federal rights to fish at Willamette Falls when we flooded Celilo Falls in the 1950s. The Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Yakima Nation, and the Warm Springs. 
and they will also go fish there as well. And the Salettes down on the coast um, have an interest in fishing as well because they have some members of their confederation who were also part of the Kalapuya, the Clackamas, um, and otherwise. So you've got five tribes with an interest in the falls. And, uh, and it becomes an interesting tribal story. And if that's one that we want to, a pathway we want to walk down in the Q&A session, I can do more there. Um, but it does bring together four public, four governments, where have you ever seen four governments get along? We've gotten along so far. Five sovereign tribal nations. Portland General Electric, as a landowner of the dam that dams uh, the Willamette River there. Falls Legacy LLC. And then the Willamette Falls Trust, where we are a nonprofit designed to be the private end of a private-public partnership. And we're, our role is really doing community engagement and resource development to help make this project happen. So that's the, it's, a, it's, an, it's an ornery project or a, or, or a big group. So now I'm back on my public engagement. We got together with four core values, um, which were essentially public access, number one. Like the first thing that we want is we don't want to have four chain link fences that stand between the public and being able to walk out to the North American continent's second largest waterfall. Like that just ain't right. It's, you know, Oregon has is, is branded itself as a, as a natural resource celebrating uh, place. Um, and, uh, and, and the nation alone, I think, should, needs to have a lot of interest here in terms of what's happening at the falls, given the stature and the power of, what's, of the water that's flowing through there. So public access, let's get to see it. Secondly, there's a lot of historical and cultural significance that happened on the site, and so that's another key value about how we come together and envision what we could do there. Habitat. It's a distinctive habitat. There are a number of endangered species there, um, from the steelhead to the chinook um, to the lamprey. Uh, the sea lions are endangered for, are endangered for different reasons, um, uh, but there, um, uh, there, there have been resident sea lions there. And again, that's another uh, a pathway I can walk down. If you want to talk sea lion, I can talk sea lion. And lastly, it's an economic development opportunity if we can bring it into the 21st century from the 20th century industry that was there. At its height, Willamette Falls was employing just the two mills surrounding Willamette Falls and that 50 acres of land employed 6,000 people. 6,000 people, and they weren't, uh, they were good jobs. This was family wage jobs that have been lost since the economic height of what was happening. So we have an op, and, and, and there are reasons why we could, um, we may not get to 6,000 family wage jobs. Again, I'm not so much an economic development guy, but there are opportunities here uh, certainly better than the zero jobs that are currently happening uh, with, the, with the properties being quiet there right now. Um, so this is the site. Uh, it's, it's what you've got here, I don't know, uh, let's see, I don't have like the fancy laser pointer or anything. Um, but what you're looking at is, is for those of you who, let's see, it's, it's, I have a laser pointer, is that what this is? Look at that, oh, there it is. All right, so look at that, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so uh, it's, a, it's a 22 and a half acre site. For those of you who've been there, right, this is the 99E S-curves. There's a tunnel in 99E right at the top of, the, of, of your screen there. Uh, the falls themselves span across the river in a horseshoe pattern, 1,700 feet across the Willamette River. And the Portland General Electric and former Crown Zellerbach Westland Paper Company site is over here. Portland is, you know, way over that way on the wall going downstream. So that's what we're looking at. The concept then that the, these partners came up with um, that was to address those four core values, public access, healthy habitat, economic development, and cultural and, and historical interpretation, was this uh, a design that they call the river walk. The river walk was conceived uh, with a number of uh, uh, consultants who came on board, but primarily the, the, the vision for the master plan, of, of, for the concept, the river walk concept, was driven by Snoheda. Uh, Snoheda is a firm out of um, uh, Oslo, Norway. They built the Oslo Opera House, for those of you who have been there, but it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting design at the end of a fjord where the building was designed to look kind of like a glacier coming into the water, and you can walk on its roof. And the interior has public spaces that everybody can go into without having to pay tickets to the opera. 
And so it was a, a, an interesting combination of arts and geography and public spaces. Snohetta was also the firm that did the landscaping plan, if you will, for um, Times Square in, in, in Manhattan in its current configuration. So they know something about public spaces and how people move in public spaces, and they've done some of the world's uh, finest. And so they, they and, and this was part of the vision here of where Willamette Falls really deserves a world-class vision. And so this, this, the, the, what they envisioned then was this series of, of walkways. These little lines are these elevated walkways that get you through the site to an you know, observation area here. And then right here is a three-story observation tower that allows you to oversee you know, the falls that are, again, going all the way out here. The middle of the falls are somewhere out here. In the high water event just two months ago, the water was pouring all over this whole section here. Um, and then finally, you get to go out on this, this is the dam owned by Portland General Electric, to a final observation point that gets you out into the middle of the falls at high water, um, through, and again, through a series of different walkways that repurposes some of the old structures that were part of this paper mill complex um, and allows you to uh, experience and celebrate some of the old industrial history. There's landscaping that calms down some of the old industrial history and allows you to really feel some of the natural values of what's going on there. Um, and, uh, and then it incorporates these public spaces. So this one right here is what we were looking at there. That's this spot right here. So what it looks like today right now, um, we call that the public yard. It's about the size of Pioneer Courthouse Square in downtown Portland. And the vision is for it to function about that in the same manner um, as Pioneer Courthouse Square. So uh, you got to, uh, you know, you can look at that. And I don't know about you, but it doesn't look like Pioneer Courthouse Square to me. Um, and so the idea is you've got to remove, you know, you've got to remove these chemical tanks that are there. Uh, there's and 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 um, uh, uh, and remove some of the uh, asbestos-clad siding that's on some of those buildings, and a lot of the other safety features uh, or, or non-safety features, I suppose, that then help make that be a place where people can gather, where there are public gathering spaces, there are opportunity for events, and the, and the design includes kind of a, a stair step down. Um, uh, 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 stair steps like that are in Pioneer Courthouse Square that would give you access to the river. Again, for those of you who spent time in downtown Oregon City, the access to the river is abysmal. It's abysmal. And um, uh, so not only can you not access the falls, like to get, you've got to, you know, cross 99 EER, EE through the traffic light over here, past the 205 interchange and wind around to get through the docks to get down and see the river. And, you know, this is a, it's a function of our, the, the old industrial heritage of our, of our country. But there's an opportunity here to do that differently and to remove a whole lot of the fill that is a safety hazard uh, due to liquefaction. I mean, the, the Cascadia subduction zone event where there was some fill that was introduced here that also has environmental contamination in it. It can get pulled away. You create access to the river. You create new habitat. You create an alcove for fish to be able to have a resting place before they go up 42 feet worth of basalt. That's the waterfall. So that's the public yard. And then this building, that's the public yard just on the left. So we were just looking at that, that section on the left. But now we're moving just a little bit to the right upstream towards the falls, and these buildings, we would take the siding off of them, we will take the siding off of them, and turn them into a three-story observation deck that gets people up high to see the falls, close access to the falls, um, uh, right on the edge, but not all the way out. And that's the first, so these two things are really the focus of the earlier phases of the project. Um, so. Uh, that's a little bit more of the what. Here's a rendering of what we're looking at, and I'm going to back you back you up a little bit to just get you oriented again. So those are those see those stacks. There's those nice red stacks. Here's a picture of that yard. The the, the photo that I was or the the rendering, the illustration, it was taken from roughly the vantage point of these white tanks here. So those things, if you're if you were standing right there, this is the idea of what you'd see looking towards the falls that are there on the right. So you'd have a nice view of the falls. You'd take some of the cladding off those structures, and it would function as a public square. A lot of the function of what Willamette Falls Trust is doing then is we're working to activate the public spaces in a very meaningful way. So that when you come to see Willamette Falls, one of the really dramatic things is how much they 
expand and collapse based on the flow of the Willamette River, right? I mean, we've all experienced that in different ways. But if you go there, maybe even today, um, the, the flow, the flow today, and I'm not an engineer, so don't quote me on this one, but I would say that it's about one hundredth of what it is uh, what it was nine weeks ago when we had some torrential rains following some snow. There was a high water event and the river at the, the river was probably about 30 to 35 feet higher right here at Willamette Falls than it is today. And so it's the ebb and flow that makes it a really interesting place to go to, but also means that you have to activate the site with public spaces in an interesting way, in a meaningful way. So what Willamette Falls Trust has done is we're engaging with a group called um, Mass Design that um, uh, they have their headquarters, not in Oslo, but in Kigali, Rwanda, because they came together following the genocide in Rwanda to bring together the warring tribes, the Hutus and the Tutsis, and said, hey, let's figure out how to create a place of healing. And they succeeded in doing that and have now, now are the largest design, nonprofit design firm on the planet. And they've created hospitals in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. And they've done, they most recently opened a thing called the Peace and Justice Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, that uh, uh, a lot of uh, 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 the, the Wall Street Journal called the most important piece of 21st century design uh, in the world. Uh, and that firm is working in Oregon City. They're working because we have to figure out how to pull together not just four governments, not just an industrial history with a natural resource, a critical natural resource area, but five sovereign tribes. And this is where we need someone who's a really, a really effective diplomat at creating architecture and programming to activate a space and tell stories in a way that are, can, can be competing stories, you know? Is the story of the, of the pioneers any more or less important than the story of the Indians who, who, who were there? Is the story of industry any more or less important than the story of the lamprey? Is the, is the story of the Chinook any more or less important than the story of the sea lions? And how do we pull those different stories together? It's the exciting opportunity of this site, is being able to pull those many stories together and tell them in a way that really celebrates um, not the single story of industry that the site tells now, but um, other 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 tales. So um, okay, there's the that's what the view from the yard looks like. You know, as you're looking to the to the to the right of this thing, that's the there's the, there's the real view uh, as it stands right now. Um, uh, this is, these are just more, more renderings that were done that give you a sense of that complex of buildings. So that observation tower that I was talking about is this thing on the right. That public yard is you know, kind of standing over here. So you get to walk through some of these old industrial buildings to get there. It's cool. I mean, you like cut holes through kilns and boilers and it has this, it's just an interesting uh, 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 design to get you there. Um, the overlook itself is uh, 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 when, when the cladding is removed, you've got these steel structures that, you know, they used to have to support these huge cylinders that would crush the pulp. And so they're, uh, they're anchored in, in, in basalt that the Willamette River hasn't been able to, you know, carve out and cart away for, for millennia. So the idea that, you know, if you're anchoring a steel beam that used to hold these really heavy cylinders at close tolerances to grind them up, it's remarkably strong. It's remarkably, you know, the, the structure is good. There are some issues with um, what we now know about the potential of a Cascadia subduction zone event that then, okay, they're strong in terms of what they can hold up, but what happens if it shakes sideways? And so some of that engineering is happening right now, um, which is significant and could have a significant impact on cost. Um, but so Mill H is the very creatively named uh, mill there that's going to be the, um, the observation tower. And that gets you a, a sense of a little closer uh, view of what the falls look like from there. So what are we doing? You know, the idea is um, we have secured uh, a project manager. And this is good. There's been a long history of like, is this project going to happen? Is it not going to happen? The public partners that have come together have certainly not always seen eye to eye with the landowner, Falls Legacy LLC. That's been um, uh, uh, somewhat celebrated in the press. Um, and, uh, and at this point now, with the easement where it is and with the permits where they are, we have, uh, we're under contract. 
with uh, someone to, 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 to build the thing, both a project manager and a construction firm. The um, project is scheduled to start in April, and that's not, uh, April as in uh, nine months from now. Uh, and we've been on track for that now for the last two years. Um, and it will be, the first phase is, is slated to be done two years following that in April of, of 20, or spring of 2022, you know, give or take. Again, it's, it's a fairly, it is, it's a very complicated project. And that's the first phase. So what that first phase is, is, is it really, it, it's, it's, it's the focus is, so this earlier stuff that gets you from, again, this is getting you from, from 99E out to this public yard, that stuff doesn't happen yet. And this last phase of getting you out on the dam, out to the middle of the falls, isn't gonna happen yet. The first phase is this access through these, the brown shaded areas into this overlook area. And so it, it gets people safe and unfettered access to the brink of the falls, a three-story, elevated view, four season view, and programming that really activates what's going on. What we feel very strongly about is that this is our opportunity to present something different for the falls. What is it gonna look like for the next 100 years? What is it gonna look like for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren? And by setting the pace, it becomes that proof of concept for what could happen next. And I would say not just on the Oregon City side of the river, but on the West Lynn side of the river uh, at the former Crown Veller Zellerbach site. Um, and so I think, uh, I think that that may be most of what I'm, I mean, this is, this is more detail on phase one and what have you, and I don't, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, I don't need to harp there. Um, and, and so our, our role then, in terms of the Willamette Falls Trust, has been to like, is doing our best to bring Willamette Falls to the public, so that, you know, people know that we're not Multnomah Falls. <laughs> um, it's to let people know the opportunity that we have, that right now is only 20 months old with mills closing on both sides of the river. So the urgency of being able to do something now is critical, um, otherwise we may have another century and a half of restricted access of private only use. Uh, and we, you know, the, as based on our four core values, that isn't right. And then we have to make sure that we really do it right. And by doing it right, it means that we're having, uh, you address a complicated history, you address a complicated history and a complicated project, but you do it safely so that people can get out there and have, a, have an experience that really is something that is, that is worthy of our Oregon pride. Um, and is worthy of the of that site of the of the nation's second largest waterfall. I'm going to do one more example on that one too, um, which is to say uh, the the th this site also includes, in terms of doing it right, the site includes the home of the uh, uh, father of Oregon, right, John McLaughlin. His house was located on this site, and I walk by it not daily, but certainly a couple times a week. And, um, and that site is occupied by a decaying kiln. Um, some foresighted women in the earlier part of last century thought that maybe it was worth preserving the, the, um, uh, the house of the, of the father of the state of Oregon, and they moved John McLaughlin's house up the hill to where it now sits on Singer Hill. But it was originally there, and it, that site, more than anything, speaks to the opportunity that we have, where there at the end of the Oregon Trail, there sits an old dormant kiln that was the site of, of the father of Oregon's home. And when I think about the other side of the Oregon Trail, where St. Louis is investing $300 million, not to build, but to restore a national park that is the gateway to the West. And when you walk through that $300 million restoration project, you then walk to the end, the focal point. People left St. Louis because they were going somewhere. And they were coming here. And Oregon Pride right now, we show Oregon Pride with a lock on a chain link fence. And the opportunity that, that stands, that locks you out from getting to the kiln that represents John McLaughlin's house, the father of Oregon. We have such an opportunity. We can do way better than that in terms of where we go and what it is that we're doing. Uh, and, and so the opportunity that we now have on this site. Is, um, and and, and so, so last bit here then, right? Show me the money. 
Um, the first phase right now is projected to cost $35 million. The public entities have already ponied up $20 million of that $35 million through a combination of state and, and, and metro and city and county uh, funds. Willamette Falls Trust has already raised $7 million to uh, supplement that 20 million. So we're at 27 million of that 35 million. The thing opens in, uh, in, in roughly two and a half years. So we've got two and a half years time to, to raise that remaining $8 million. But wait, there's still more. The reason I'm up here right now and not somebody from one of our public entities uh, is because as a private entity, I can also call your attention to the fact that the, um, uh, uh, the Metro Parks and Nature Bond that we will vote for in the Portland metro area and the metro region, if you're within the metro voting region, is, uh, will not increase your current tax rate. It is an extension of existing parks and nature bonds. The first one that happened in 95, the second happened in 2006, the third one is happening in 2019 on November 5th of this year. In that bond, there is slated $20 million for this project specifically. It is the first and only project in the three time uh, re-ups of this bond to have a specific project named and it's because this one incorporates so many important values between people and nature and otherwise. So $20 million will show up for that for the second phase of what's happening and we may be able to blend them both while they're going. And since I'm a private entity, I get to say, so vote yes on that bond, um, which I feel very strongly about and it enables us to leverage, to continue to le leverage additional philanthropic dollars for what it is that we're doing. So. Um, uh, anyway, I, I, I think that, that you know, here, here ends my tales. I, I guess I need to fundamentally answer the question, um, too, of, well, why Gresham? Why am I standing here and why Gresham? Should I have answered that question first? Yeah. Oh, I should have answered it first? No, 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 don't say that. The, 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 uh, but, but so, and, and, the, and the issue of, you know, why Gresham? This is, this, this, this is, a, this is not just a regional destination. It is, it is a national destination. Uh, Oregon tourism is very clear that um, uh, 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 Multnomah Falls is, is, is full to bursting in terms of its capacity, and we all know the experience there of trying to park there or otherwise. And so where are the other destinations that when people are coming to the Portland metro area and they need to know where to go, and where are those destinations that are right on the urban growth boundary that can serve as portals out to the broader Willamette Valley? And this is firmly recognized as one of them. And so in terms of the economic development that we see happening there, in terms of the tourism dollars, in terms of the attention that we're bringing and the jobs that are created as a result of creating a 21st century destination on 50 acres of land surrounding the North American continent's largest, second largest waterfall, you know, we see the whole region stands to benefit in terms of what it is that we're doing. Um, so, thanks for letting me uh, 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 rattle on about it. There's been other stuff in the in the press around the tribes and around the uh, what's happening on the on the PGE site. But if there are questions, I'm more than happy to take whatever questions folks may have. Yes, you do. <laughs> no casino, right? <laughs> the uh, you know I don't get to speak for the Grand Ronde, right? Uh, and the Grand Ronde statement, and I quote. There is no plan for a casino. Uh, what I can say to that as well is that, um, uh, in addition to that, is that they have, we have been working closely with them to um, make sure that we get to move forward with the river, river walk as envisioned. And they have been very supportive. Um, they've had to submit public documents to Department of Environmental Quality that support the vision of the river walk as it stands. Um, there are certainly details to be sorted out. Um, uh, so so they've, been a, they've been a great partner. They've been a partner before it was that they uh, 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 submitted their or, or negotiated a purchase and sale agreement with the current owner. Um, so we're, we, and we look forward to their, you know, really, they have a vision, you know, they have a vision, they have resources, and so they can drive something. Now, whether no, well, you know, there is no plan for a casino, that's a present tense verb. I can't tell you about if there might be plans for a casino in the future. Uh, I believe that they have been working really closely with us in good faith, and we have, uh, we've appreciated that, and their, and their continued commitment for this project um, is, is what we're most invested in. They're a private landowner in 
and, and that pathway is, is, is what it is or may be. The other thing I will say too, so the Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde negotiated a purchase and sale agreement for the site um, uh, probably about roughly a month ago and that hit the press you know, three weeks ago. Um, and the other thing is that there are four other tribes that have an interest in being able to fish at the falls and have access to the falls and, um, and, 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 and the, the five different tribes don't see eye to eye on many, many things, um, uh, and it, like all people. Um, and so but we, and we are committed to making sure that all Oregonians and all, all five tribes as Oregonians have, have access via this project to the falls. And the Grand Ronde have said the same thing, that they're also very committed to all Oregonians having access to the falls. And we've really appreciated that unequivocal firm commitment from them. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming out and explaining all this to us. I lost a little bit of the train. I'm a little slow on some of this. Who actually owns the, the site now? Yeah, thanks for asking that. I, 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 uh, sorry, I, I tend to speak fairly quickly, and there are lots and lots of moving parts in this thing. And so when I went back and did that slide of all those partners, it's owned by a private entity, and frankly, I would say a private individual who formed an LLC for obvious reasons to prevent liability, but it's a private individual that owns a land. Um, that's right, just the Oregon City side. So Falls Legacy LLC owns it. There is a current purchase and sale agreement for the, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde to buy it from Falls Legacy LLC. There have been previous offers. And so again, it has been a, or, and, and potential sales. It's just, it's a, it's a very complicated site. And to really do all your due diligence would take you months, if not years. There's environmental contamination issues. There are demolition issues. It's difficult to pencil out from a development vision standpoint. Privately held, the public partners secured via a memorandum of understanding then between the four public partners secured an easement that, you know, roughly covers, I mean, it covers the bulk of the site. It leaves about six and a half acres for economic development for the landowner, but the rest of it is very complicated to, to develop because of the floods. Uh, much of the site was underwater in the 96 floods. More of it was underwater on the even higher 64 floods. The Army Corps of Engineers cares a lot about what happens both on overwater structures and anything that might be below that 96 high water mark. And so part of the reason why Snowhead had designed these Explorer Trails is that they are um, easily maintained. They do not, they won't float down river when there's a big flood. You know, we won't find them in the middle of Portland Harbor. And so, so that, that's part of the issue. And, and they aren't, it's not a complicated structure. It's not like you're trying to put a, a five-star hotel beneath the high water mark. Well, my, my follow-up question, I guess, was there's probably a lot of money that was invested into this property to purchase it. I was wondering how the owner got his money back out. And I think you kind of answered that. Oh, well, let me say that. I mean, he, he, he purchased it in 2014 for $2.2 million. You know, so it was, uh, which is, you know, it's a real risk capital move. I, I you know, it, it probably appraises in somewhere the negative, it, it, would, it, would, it would have a negative appraisal, and I would say negative tens of millions, in fact, due to the environmental liabilities and the demolition liabilities. So, you know, but I think that he's, his plan, it appears, is largely to uh, get his money out by selling to somebody who has a very clear and actionable development vision. Did I not read in the media uh, recently that one of the companies there, a paper mill, is reopening? On the west side of the river, there is an island. Um, the island is owned by Portland General Electric. Here we go, we're gonna get, I mean, this gets complicated too, right? This isn't even the site that I, this is just across the river. So on the west side is an island owned by Portland General Electric. They own it, they've owned it since um, uh, 1888 when the dam went in, and in 1893, the first long distance power transmission in the known universe occurred from there to uh, downtown Portland. It was a feat of, of electrical engineering that had not yet before been seen and is part of that story of industrial innovation on that site. On top, so what they care about is the generation of power through the Sullivan Power Plant that happened on that site and continues to operate power there today. And Portland General Electric has been very clear that's their, their investment. They leased that rock 
the bulk of what they're not using because the power plant doesn't take the 25 or 30 acres that that island is. They leased it to a series of, power, of, of paper companies, Crown Zellerbach and then Westland Paper Company, that then, uh, I don't think they formally declared bankruptcy, but they shut down. Their supply chain got interrupted and they shut a massive operation for now 20 months, um, which the former general manager uh, has a vision for, um, uh, how, how to potentially make money on an industry that's, uh, you know, an industry that, a massive operation that got shut down for 20 months, and he's secured a, a five-year lease with two five-year options to continue. I view this as a very short-term fix at the falls where we really need to be thinking about a long-term vision of what can happen across both sides of the river. So what it does now is it creates 80, if, if it, comes to fruition, it creates 80 jobs for people to work on the Westland side of the river in the newly reconstituted or newly formed um, Willamette Falls paper company, as if we don't have enough Willamette Falls entities as well. Uh, so we'll see. And he said that that will be uh, up and running in the end of August. Um, so, but, but I, and I, and I, I fully expect that to be a short term something. And again, it looks very much to be like a short term something. By short term, I'm thinking, you know, five years and potentially longer than that. I have a question. Uh, you haven't presented any numbers as far as uh, um, the number of people who are going to be driven to the falls. <clears throat> By driven, I mean attracted to the falls over the years. And, in a study that I participated in a few years ago, it was between 500,000 and a million five per year. Do you have any updates to that? We don't. It's funny. I mean, I was in a meeting. I came from a meeting that I'm going to go back to this morning where that, that, this, was, this was the very question because it's how big is the first phase? You know, how big do you make the first phase to be able to absorb that? Those numbers were largely driven by looking at, at, at Multnomah Falls and equivalent um, amenities. Uh, this, this, Oregon City residents are really justifiably very concerned about parking and traffic. Um, it is the constraining feature of the site because you've got the intersection of, you know, basalt cliffs that are more than 42 feet. I mean, they go up to, the, to Singer Hill, um, a, a railway right of way that has 22 trains a day, passenger and freight. Um, so, you, so state highway. Uh, uh, railway right of way, and uh, and and then you've got a site that the Army Corps of Engineers cares about what happens over the river. Uh, the 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 Federal Energy Regulatory Commission cares about what happens with the dam. Uh, you've got to get equipment to go in and out of there to make sure that the dam is 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 safe. Uh, and 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 then it's a very limited site with one with a single access point. Um, so the current projections remain, you know, at at, at its height. Two million a year, um, if we're going to meet what Multnomah Falls is doing. Uh, but until that time, you know, we have we have 75 parking spaces stipulated for Phase One, and it's not going to be able to absorb more than those people who are going to be able to come and 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 park there for that first phase. There are future aspects of that that show access to the neighborhoods above via walkways and, and, and that kind of thing. But I think that those are future phases that are, that will, um, you know, it'll depend a lot on how, how, how it works with the community. I mean, this, it, it is an Oregon City amenity. It is also a national amenity, and those two have to play together. You know, it has to be a place where Oregon, par Oregon City parents can take their kids safely at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, and it has to be a place where somebody's coming for a convention uh, to the Gresham Convention Center um, and then uh, and, and wants to take light rail all the way down to, 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 to get there. I know, I'm sorry. I, it was, you know. <laughs> Thank you. I had a whole list of questions, but I think you've hit most of them. So the hazmat, is that part of phase one? Because I think because it's on a waterway and there's asbestos and all the other things involved, you'd have to have the Coast Guard involved if you're going to be removing stuff from there. Yeah, the Coast, the Coast Guard is definitely like they yeah. have to, they're part of the Army Corps of Engineers yeah. permitting. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm, so I'm not the permitting guy or a project right, manager, right. so don't hold me to any of that. But here's what I will say. There is absolutely uh, 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 
hazardous material abatement happening. It is yeah. primarily in some fill that was introduced to the site mm -hmm. and in the removal of asbestos cladding and then some lead paint. Yeah. Um, but we did core samples all throughout the site and um, it's actually remarkably clean. clean. Yeah. There were floods. Is there fishing being done now by, by the Native Americans? Yeah. There is, okay. And even maybe today, I mean, we're right in lamprey right. season. Right. right, so they're picking lamprey off the rocks as they suck their way up the basalt. So have they not talked about getting federal funding? Because the federal government is going to have a lot to say about this, except paying for it, right? Yeah, the, the, uh, right? I mean, there, there have been a couple of, so there have been a couple of sources of federal funding via, via the EPA and Brownfields. That's, that's one of them to, to knit together those two questions. And then the federal delegation has been well apprised of what it is that we're, yeah. So we're, we're, we're working with them. I think a lot of what's happening now is the state has invested the catalytic early money, as has some private philanthropy. The question now is, um, is, is so, you know, can we come together and make it happen? And it, yeah, I mean, it really is like, so, so this is why the proof of concept of the first phase matters so much, and that we come together and say, okay, this is what we want, this is where we're headed, this, this, this is a good thing, and I, it's going to take federal involvement. It's just, you know, private philanthropy alone won't do it, and, and it, it, it isn't, you know, the, the vision here is of at least $150 million for the river walk alone, and that's not the kind of money that you take the Portland metro area and shake it upside down and hope that it falls out of their wallets. It just, it's not going to happen that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was um, fascinating, frankly, starting with the fact that I had no idea that that was the second largest waterfall in the country by volume. Um, I do have one story about a friend of mine um, who actually went over those falls in the 96 flood um, <laughs> just said, it's just a little ripple at that point. <laughs> he got arrested <laughs> for doing that. I think he paid a fine. <laughs> so thank you again to our sponsors, uh, Columbia Bank, uh, Portland General Electric, including their dam, I guess, uh, Gresham Barlow School District and Metro East Community Media. Don't forget about the replay schedule. Uh, some upcoming events, uh, October 17th is our business summit, uh, lessons uh, from the Mouse House. We're going to have uh, Pete Blank from the Disney University come and present, so you can register online. Uh, seats, I think, are going to go pretty fast. Um, next month, our speaker will be Senator Lori Monis Anderson and Senator Chuck Thompson, so we'll get a um, replay of what happened. <laughs> Um, don't forget, next week is our golf tournament, uh, July 26th, Friday, Glendiver uh, Country Club, or golf club, I guess. Um, and be sure to pick up the replay schedule. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.